Good evening, everybody. We we've come on a little bit early. We've we've still got quite a lot of um, people to join. We've got quite a high number of um, people registered for this evening's uh, webinar, as we might expect, given the given the topic being around the uh, environmental land management scheme um, and the recent update we had to that since the new year. So. Hopefully we're going to learn a little bit tonight as well, but we'll just give it a um, a minute or two for people to people to join, and I'll just do a little bit of uh, a little bit of basic housekeeping um, to start with, just so that you know um, the webinar is being recorded, um, and for those of you who want to listen back or want to point people that haven't been able to. Um, attend this evening to listen to it. It's on uh, our YouTube channel and the website. Um, we would encourage you to register on the YouTube channel, then you can see uh, all the other webinars that we have been doing. They're all on there. Um, the recent ones we've had last month was the Story Story Scheme, which obviously is now live. Um, before Christmas, we had uh, a webinar about the rock report and also around natural capital opportunities so um we've covered quite a few article uh, quite a few topics over the past two years i can't believe it's two years that we've been doing this but that's uh that's that's good to know um so if you do want to if you do want to go and have a look back at anything um you can uh as i say look at it on the website or or on a youtube channel um I'm also really pleased to say that we are sponsored during this winter and spring run of uh, webinars by Oxbury Bank, uh, who may not be familiar to all of you. They're very much the new kids on the block. They were founded in 2021, so very recently, uh, by bankers, farmers and technologists as the UK's only 100% dedicated to serving farmers, food producers in the rural economy. Um, so probably worth uh, probably worth finding out a bit about them. Um, their team of relationship managers understand both farming and finance and enable them to discuss bespoke lending opportunities with farmers face-to-face -face on farm. And combined with the modern technology, it allows Oxford to deliver quick decisions and competitively priced products. Um, they consider farming to be very much a people business and they pride themselves on putting people and farmers first. So uh, that, that's that's pretty good to hear. And it's I think it's always quite good when we get a uh, what in, into what is quite a traditional sector of banking. You get someone who may be not necessarily disruptive, but new and uh, perhaps keeps everybody on their toes. So worth looking at. They They tell us that they are pretty positive about the future of farming. And they see big opportunities available for both the food and farming sector going forward. And they're actively seeking to help farmers take advantage of these by funding improvements in efficiency, productivity, reducing carbon footprints, producing energy, high quality crops and livestock. So uh, pretty much, I think, in line with uh, the, the, the sort of outlook that perhaps we all have. So uh, it might be worth you know taking a look, but we're very, we're very, um, very grateful for them for uh, coming in and uh, sponsoring these these webinars, and it's an important part of, of uh, our sustainability at the TFA that we have the support of the likes of Oxbury. So a big a big thank you to them. Um, I should also mention uh, that we have some teaching videos as well, uh, also on on our website and on the YouTube channel. Um, uh, you'll see on the screen there. Top tips for applying for a tenancy, understanding joint tenancy. What if my landlord won't give me consent uh, to expand my slurry store? And uh, do you know where your tenancy agreement is? That's a pretty good question um, that we may, a lot of us, not know the answer to. Um, so, yeah, quite a lot of stuff to, to take a look at um, if, if you need to. So, anyhow, moving on, on to this evening, I'm, I'm hoping pretty much everybody who's going to join has joined um, and we want to make use of the hour that we've got. Um, as many of you will know, we've uh, we've had some recent announcement from DEFRA about the future farm policy, uh, starting uh, with Mark Spencer at the Oxford Farming Conference. 
and then sort of throughout January with some new options on Elm. So I'm really grateful and pleased once again to be joined by Janet Hughes uh, from DEFRA, who's the Programme Director of the Future Farming and Countryside Programme. Uh, Janet has been uh, kind enough to attend these webinars and present at these webinars uh, last year too. And um, so she's she's going to tell us a little bit more about what the new what the new developments are when we can see uh, hopefully how we can all start to get involved with it. Um, and so it'd be good to it'd be good to hear from Janet about where all of that is at. First of all, we're going to hear from uh, Lynette Steele, who many of you will know and have come across. Lynette's our farm policy advisor here at the TFA working tirelessly and sometimes a little bit frustratingly, I believe, I think, in some of the engagement meetings, but tireless, tirelessly on all our behalfs um, to really put the, the TFA point of view and uh, fight for tenants in a lot of the new developments that are coming along. Lynette's been with us um, since 2018. As many of you will know, she's also gets her hands dirty alongside her husband on a tenanted arable holding in Hampshire. So she uh, sits on both sides of the fence here. So that's that's good. And we're going to hear from Lynette and the TFA viewpoint. Before we start, I would just say that I, I, I think we are now in a stage where it's quite important for us to probably get our own hands dirty in terms of getting involved with ALMS. There's certain things that we know we can't get involved with at the moment, and maybe we'll hear from Janet when we can. But I think it's really important that as an industry, we start to really engage with this because the funding around uh, the, the agricultural budget is, is guaranteed for the length of this parliament. The length of this parliament is shortening by the day, obviously, and it's probably only got uh, probably at best another 18 months to run. And that's not a very long period of time. So I think it, it's important for all of us to get involved, see what you can do. There is a lot of detail out there now. We've been trying out for DEFRA to give us some detail. So uh, we need to take that on board now, I think, and uh, uh, and start to get involved where we can. Anyway, without without further ado, let's, let's get cracking. We want to have a bit of time for q and I'm 100% confident we won't answer all of the questions tonight. Um, Janet has kindly offered to give us answers to those questions that we don't get round to. So apologies in advance if we don't ask your question. If you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen rather than in the chat box. So uh, we'll get started and I'll pass over to Lynette to give us the sort of TFA view as to where we think we are at the moment. So thank you, Lynette. Thanks very much, Mark. And um, it's great to see so many of you here again this evening. Um, it wasn't that long ago we hosted our last webinar on the policy update. Um, so hopefully a lot of you joined us there and will know that the TFA has been calling um, on DEFRA to set out a more robust offering to farmers. Um, and at long last, we are now seeing a more feasible SFI scheme developing. The addition of the six standards is, is great news, which were announced in January. And that does now mean that a broader range of farm businesses are able to participate in the scheme. The announcement at the Oxford Farming Conference um, by the Minister of an annual management payment of £20 per hectare for the first 50 hectares in an agreement is also, you know, really welcomed. Um, and for the first time, it acknowledges that the time contributions take and to apply and implement these types of agreements is being recognised. So now, in most cases, there with the range of options which will be available this year for SFI, um, the majority of farmers can engage with the scheme. Um, much of the However, much of the 2023 offering targets farmers more on an arable and lowland grass system. And despite moorlands and upland farms having huge potential to deliver um, environmental goods, the need for more options to target these farm types are urgently required to enable those farmers to access sufficient funding um, and help achieve those government environmental goals which have been set into legislation. 
Additionally to this, DEFRA's um, prospectus document, which some of you might have trawled through the 110 pages of it, but I'm sure many of you haven't, which is understandable, um, was published at the end of January. Um, this document further details initiatives that it will bring in, that DEFRA will bring in over the next few years um, under an expanded offering through the pre-existing countryside stewardship scheme. What this perspective now does enables us to understand what opportunities are available in the future, and as uh, which is which is great news for business planning um, as we continue to move away from historic area-based payments. However, um, and there is a however, there is some vital areas that need further clarity at which the TFA are continuing to press DEFRA um, to look at some of it urgently um, over the coming weeks and months ahead. One of those areas is deliverability, and we need to hear far more about this. Historically, we've seen some policy initiatives struggle due to poor administration, and there will need to be good dialogue between policymakers and organisations such as the RPA, who will be charged with delivering the policy in the field. Application processes, payment terms, regulation and enforcement fears must also be addressed in the immediate future. Um, if farmers are going to feel they can enter these schemes in the knowledge that it will be more of a partnership with government um, to, deliver, to deliver on these environmental goals rather than a dictatorship. Furthermore, what's good to see is that some of the specific challenges faced by tenant farmers have been identified. Um, ha and the government um, has yet, to, um, but the government have yet to um, respond in detail to those recommendations made in the ROC report, which was uh, provided to DEFRA last October. The report, which I'm sure many of you will know, contains some really important solutions for government on scheme designs, changes to legislation, taxation, and wider issues. And it must now get on with delivering those recommendations. And the response to the report is now absolutely vital to ensure that tenant farmers are not disadvantaged due to inadequate or ill-informed policy decisions. As Mark has already said, there is absolutely no doubt we are now in a critical point for the industry's relationship with government and the public. The Agricultural Transition Plan, which includes SFI and countryside stewardship, um, are now taking shape. We're seeing some more of that detail. And the industry now needs to engage positively with the schemes on offer so that we can demonstrate what positive contribution we can make towards the climate change agenda. Consequences of not getting involved or being indifferent to these schemes on offer is not desirable either for our agricultural businesses or for those government's environmental targets. And although, as with many government schemes, um, the details and functionality may not be perfect at the moment to suit all situations or all farming types, um, let's not get perfect, let, let's not let perfect get in the way of good. One of the benefits of having UK control of these schemes is the ease with which changes can be applied to improve schemes and develop as they develop over time. Um, and that's where the TFA come in to ensure those developments improve and enhance the scheme for our members. And as always, um, we encourage members to call the office to speak to myself or Mark or George and let us know of the real life experiences you're having with those schemes so we can feed back any issues to Janet and her team. Um, so that's a quick viewpoint from the TFA. I hope Janet will be able to address some of those fears that I've highlighted um, in that quick five minutes and I'm absolutely without doubt that you all have some pressing questions of your own to put to that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thanks Lynette. I think that's a very good very good summary of where we of where we are and um, I think I think obviously on the positive side we're very supportive and grateful that we have made some progress particularly at the start of this year um, Jana, and that's that's really good news. We just need to 
keep that momentum going and 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 build on it. And it's good to see, as as Lynette pointed out, that there have been some concessions and some listening, if you like, to around the accessibility for tenants. I think there is still some way to go, and we'll probably cover that in in the in the Q and A. But it's good to see, at least we've certainly where SFI is concerned, there is a little bit more uh, ability to do that than perhaps we thought. So. Um, We'll move straight over on to Janet. As I say, Janet's the, the head of the uh, uh, Future Food and Farming Programme. We've met Janet before on a few occasions. So we're again, once again, grateful for her to coming and speaking to us tonight. So uh, over to you, Janet. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And thanks ever so much for having me. It's a great opportunity to talk to you all and looking forward to the questions and answers. And thank you, Tenant Farmers Association, for your critical friendship, as, as we like to call it. And it is critical, but it is also friendship because we're trying to make this work together. We all want this to work for farmers. And TFA have been really active in pushing us to publish the detail, as has been mentioned, get our prices right in our schemes, make things work better for farmers, especially tenant farmers. And also tell us when things don't work first time and help us to improve things and get them right and that's how we'll get there as Lynette says by listening and improving as we go because we won't get everything right first time despite our best efforts so massive thanks for that and the first thing I want to say which I always try to say in these events is we really recognize in DEFRA the massive pressure and uncertainty that you're facing by way of input costs the implications of the Ukraine crisis um, and the illegal invasion of Ukraine, the impacts of climate change, whilst at the same time, in many cases, being blamed for climate change unfairly, um, the issues with the supply chain, the labour market, and obviously the agriculture transition, which is the bit that I'm looking after, and the phasing out of basic payments. We really do recognise that this is not an abstract policy question. This is about you and your livelihoods and your communities. And we take that really seriously here in DEFRA. Um, what we're here to achieve in the programme that I'm responsible for is to support the farming sector to be profitable and to thrive um, and to continue producing food broadly at current levels in terms of domestic food production. But also we really recognise the important role farmers can play in contributing to the sorts of goals that we're now setting for reversing the decline in biodiversity in the countryside, improving water quality, um, improving air quality, storing carbon in the countryside and adapting to the impacts of climate change in the countryside as well, given that farmers are occupy and look after 70% of our, the land in our country, it's really important to us that we achieve these objectives because if we don't, we're not going to have food production in the long term either that's resilient, but also because we want to address these issues of biodiversity, climate change, water quality, etc. And it's farmers that are going to need to do that work. And we know that farmers need to be recognised properly and paid properly and supported properly to do that work so that you can produce both food that we need to feed the country as you do so well and have particularly done so well in the last few years, despite all of the challenges, and also to take care of the natural environment. And we think these things can and must go hand in hand over the long term. And lots of the things that we're trying to put in place, we're trying to design them so that they're good for your farm business, good for the resilience of food production, and also good for the environment and climate. And we're always trying to aim for that sweet spot wherever we can. And to achieve that, we're doing three sets of things. We are trying to improve the services that we offer to farmers. And I include in that the regulatory services, as well as the schemes that we offer. And as Lynette was saying, it's absolutely critical that policymakers like me um, and my team work absolutely hand in glove with the RPA and other agencies like any environment agency forestry commission to make sure that what we're doing is actually going to work and to make sure that it works for you so that it's clear simple fast and fair and proportionate you don't have to fear being penalized for minor breaches that are of no consequence you can expect us to treat you with respect and respect your role in food production and in your communities and to respond fairly and also to respond appropriately when when somebody is letting the side down and flagrantly breaking the rules because lots of farmers say it's all very well punishing me for not doing my form correctly but what about your man down the road who is actually doing bad stuff that you don't even seem to notice so we've got to flip that on its head we've got to do our regulatory services much better and we've started making improvements there improving the way we control schemes as well and improving the services that we offer through schemes and we know that that's really important it's the most important work we've got to do because otherwise we can't expect any of you to have any respect for us i'm talking about respecting you but we want you to be able to trust us and see us as people who are here to help you succeed and competent in doing that and trustworthy as partners for you and we know that we haven't always been in a position to earn that trust and that's what we're trying to do now so that's the first thing improve our services the second thing is to offer these environmental land management schemes 
And there are three of those, as you'll know. There's the Sustainable Farming Incentive, which is designed to be of mass appeal eventually and to offer payment for things which are good for the farm business, good for food and good for the environment. And then things that you can do in the course of your farming. And we have made that scheme much more accessible to tenant farmers than any scheme before it. So shorter agreement lengths, the ability to leave without a penalty if you lose management control of your land, you don't need landlord consent and the actions are the sorts of things you should be able to do within your tenancy contract because they're in the course of your normal farming on the whole. And um, so that's the sustainable farming incentive. And we opened that on a small scale last year, offering just a very limited range of options. This year, we're going large with the sustainable farming incentive. We're going to offer twice as much scope as we thought we were going to do 19 new actions, all of which have been reviewed to make them um, workable and flexible for farmers and to offer a range of choices so that you, you can do a range of options on your land that will add up to, a, to an agreement that's actually worth getting out of bed for for you. And those, those, the details of those are coming out now um, and then we will open them for applications as soon as we can this summer. That's the sustainable farming incentive. Second scheme is countryside stewardship that already exists, of course. We've been improving that in recent years and we've now got nearly twice as many agreements in that scheme as we had three years ago, thanks to those improvements and thanks to people now moving in that general direction anyway. Um, we are going to be adding more scope into that scheme. Um, and we're also, uh, we, and we publish details about what that scope is going to cover and what the actions are going to be and how much we're going to pay for them. We published that a couple of weeks ago. Um, and also, we're going to offer additional payments through that scheme for doing things in partnership with others in your local area. So you join up to deliver better results, for doing things in the right places so that they really have an impact, and for doing things in the right combinations, the right level of ambition, the right scale to really achieve amazing results. So you'll get your kind of base level payment of income for gone plus cost payments, which we published a couple of weeks ago. And then there'll be these extra um, incentives on top of that for doing things really well in the right places and in a joined up way. So that's countryside stewardship. That will continue to evolve over the next year or two. If you're in it already, that's fine. We'll evolve it with you in it. And if you're not in it yet, then it'll be mid-tier will be opening for applications very shortly. Higher tiers already open. So I really encourage you to take a look at the offer this year if you're not in the scheme already. And indeed, if you are in a scheme already and you'd like another one on the side, including if you're an HLS, you can now have a CS agreement on the side of that if you'd like. And then the final scheme is landscape recovery. And you might think, oh, well, that's not relevant to tenant farmers because it's long term and larger scale. But actually, half of our new projects, half of our first round of projects in landscape recovery include tenant farmers working with other land managers and landowners on these projects. So I encourage you to take a look at that. We've got 22 projects. Like I say, half of them involve tenants. Almost all of them are groups of farmers working together over an area. I visited a group last week which had several farmers in it who had only recently formed a cluster and are going to be working to protect the river catchment in their area and enhance biodiversity and water quality there. Exciting stuff and they want a long-term commitment. And we're going to open another round. Those are competitive bids that we invite on landscape recovery and we'll open another round for applications this spring. So watch this space if you're interested in that one. So that's the second thing, environmental land management schemes. And the third thing is one-off grants. And we offer a range of one-off grants um, for productivity, innovation, research, development, animal health and welfare, slurry management. And we are going to be publishing much more advanced information for you about what grants are coming. And we're going to start offering them all through one service so that you can find them really easily. And you can see what's coming and you can see what's relevant to you because at the moment we have multiple different types of grant schemes. And it's very hard to keep track of it and we know that. So we're working towards offering all of these things that I'm describing in one service so you can just pick the things that are relevant to you in a really straightforward way and um, have the flexibility to change what you're doing, have the flexibility to update it um, and really make it work for you as part of your farm business, which is what we want to see happening. So that's what we're doing. Um, we published some information recently, as um, Lynette and Mark have mentioned, about what we're offering in the Sustainable Farming Incentive this year. The main things I really want you to know about that are that we've really listened to the feedback about our pilot and our early rollout, and we've made the scheme much more flexible so that there's no requirements to do lots of actions bundled together. You can choose the range of actions that you want to do, and you can choose how much land you want to do them on. So much more flexible for you to pick and mix what it is that you want to do, less prescription, wider eligibility than in countryside stewardship for some of the options. And some of the options we're going to offer are based on options in countryside stewardship, but they're more flexible and they're available on SFI terms and conditions, so more accessible to tenant farmers. And the direction of travel is that we're going to put more and more things on those terms and conditions and wherever we, wherever we can do that so that we can make them much more accessible to tenants and so that they can fit farm businesses in a more straightforward way. Um, we've also announced we're going to pay a management fee in the, in the SFI where we'll recognise the cost of being in a scheme and you can get up to £1,000 a year for that fee. 
Um, and we're trying to, as I say, pay for actions that make sense for the farm business as well as for the environment. So they, they can help you reduce your costs, improve the resilience of your business, reduce your inputs, um, as well as improving water quality, et cetera. We've made it really straightforward to apply. We've made the control regime much fairer and more proportionate. And we've really reduced the bureaucracy relative to historic schemes. And we're now trying to apply those improvements to countryside stewardship. So whichever scheme you come into, you should have a simple, clear, fast and fair and flexible service that works for you. So that's the SFI. Um, the Rock Review was mentioned. So if you haven't read it, I, I commend it to you. Uh, George was a member of the panel, um, among other esteemed um, people who are experts in tenancy and farming. It's a really serious piece of work and we're giving it very serious consideration. So we're not hanging about looking at it or cracking on with implementing things inside it. There will be a formal government response to it in, uh, in due course, which means soon. Um, but I can't give you a date just yet, I'm afraid, but it will, we are working to get it out soon because we know people want to see what's the response of government to these recommendations. And it's a wide ranging report. So there are some things which are much more straightforward that we can just get on with within our programme about making our schemes more accessible. And then there are some which are more of a kind of wider government issue, for example, how tax works or how planning works. And that for those, we're working with other government departments so we can pull together a comprehensive government response. And you can be assured that Tenant Farmers Association and others have been very much pursuing that and, want, and, and wanting us to crack on with it. And we are very much doing that and ministers are very much doing that too. Um, and the final thing I just wanted to mention is that obviously many farmers in the uplands are tenants. And we've had question, Lynette mentioned the options that are available for those on grassland or moorland. And I just wanted to say a couple of words about that, if I may, because I'm sure there'll be questions about this, which are that we, we have, we think, put forward a bigger, better offer for uplands. And um, I mean, including in that both grassland and moorland this year, we brought forward some of the elements of SFI that we weren't going to do till next year. So low input grassland, for example. Um, and we also have made changes to the rules around higher level stewardship. So we've already made it possible for you to transfer across to countryside stewardship if you're in HLS um, without a gap so that you can end your HLS agreement on a date of your choosing to go straight into CS. This year, if you don't want to come out of HLS, you can have a countryside stewardship and or SFI agreement on the side if you want to. As long as we're not paying you for the exact same actions twice or incompatible actions on the same land, then have at it if you want to have more than one agreement. Um, and we think that's important to give those in HLS access to the wider range of options. And um, we have extended the range of options for upland and grassland farmers in recent years in countryside stewardship, and we've also increased the prices. So for example, the low input grassland option in the uplands is now um, 98 pounds, it was 16 pounds a hectare. So it's multiplied by more than six. Um, and I did mention as well, that's not the end of the story in terms of prices, because we're looking at these other incentives that we want to pay on top of that too. Um, if you're in a protected landscape, and 74% of national parks are in upland areas, then you can have access to that scheme, although I recognise that's not all upland farmers. Um, and obviously we've increased prices in countryside stewardship two years running now as well. Um, I've mentioned what we've done for tenants. What I would really encourage you to do if you are worrying about the uplands and thinking about what's available to you is have a look at the document. I know it's long, but we have tried to chunk it up in a way that makes it accessible. It's not loads and loads of terrible policy paragraphs. It is mostly just fairly succinct information about what's available. And there's about 130 options in, that, we're go, that we're offering, including new ones for uplands that are going to be relevant to upland farmers. So I really encourage you to have a look at the detail if you are thinking about this and you're in an upland setting as a tenant farmer, because we think there's a lot there for you. But having said that, we're not at the end of the story. As Mark and Lynette have both said, we're, we're always working with Tenant Farmers Association and directly with farmers and with other organisations to continue refining what we're doing here. So we're really keen to hear if you think we've got gaps, if you've got suggestions, if you've got concerns, we want to know about it and we will carry on. And I hope we've shown with the way that we've changed the sustainable farming incentive this year that we genuinely are listening to that feedback and we really are keen to hear it and act on it. So I wanted to just preempt some of your questions, at least with that. And then let's, um, I'm very happy, very much looking forward to getting into the questions and answers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Janet. Um, really, really useful as, as ever. Really good to, to hear what's, what's going on and what's, and what's coming forward. Um, and as you might expect, we have got quite a lot of questions around various things. So I'll just ask Lynette, oh yeah, Lynette's there already, rejoin us as well so we can um, cover a, a few of these questions. And I think we'll just get cracking because I'm, as ever, conscious of time. We've got quite a few in the chat. We've got a few that we had beforehand. I, I'll start perhaps with a, a, 
maybe maybe a reasonably straightforward question. I'm not sure the answer is quite as straightforward as we'd like it to be, but uh, we had we had one sent in by a member from Worcestershire, uh, which was simply, "When will the new SFI options be available? Um, when can we sign up for them?" We're going to make them available in the summer. I realise that's not a specific date. That's because I don't want to under prom I don't want to over promise and then fail to deliver. But I also don't want to under promise, and um, because we want we want to get make these available as soon as we possibly can. What we're trying to do is make it possible. Make, do two things. First of all, we've got an automated service that means that when you log in, you can see which options are relevant and eligible. Which which options are you eligible for on different bits of your land you don't have to work that out and also for the first time ever we want to be able to allow you to stack different options on the same parcel of land so that you can have say a soil standard and an integrated pest management option and a hedgerow option maybe a margin all on the same field if that's what you want to do so you can really max out on your environmental income and productivity and um, to do that we have to build the system and as you all know if you've been a farmer for longer than a couple of years you will know that that is not something that we've always done well in DEFRA. So last year we launched SFI successfully. It's a much quicker process. We're turning around applications within less than two weeks, often much quicker. We've had farmers tell us it took them only 20 minutes to apply. We want to carry that forward into this year. That takes a bit of delivery. So that's why we're not doing it immediately um, because we don't want to fall over. We want to get that delivery right to make it really easy for you when you come in. We will do it as soon as we possibly can in the summer and we'll confirm a date a bit nearer the time when we're able to do that. But we know that the sooner the better we, we are in no doubt about that at all and 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 so i guess i guess there's a sort of supplementary question to that then is what is there then now to encourage me uh not me personally i'm already in sfi but I know, um, that's good but actually actually i guess it's it's relevant for both situations for someone like myself who's entered sfi but also for somebody who might be considering it what is the incentive to enter now uh will I be able to add those various options into my existing scheme? Or if I entered one in February with what is available now, will I be able to enter those things that are coming along in the summer? Or will I have to wait for an anniversary date? Because I think yeah. that might lead people to sit on their hands a bit. Yeah, so rule number one, there's a, there's a number of rule number ones. One rule number one is nobody who's already entered schemes can possibly be put at a disadvantage. That would be complete. That would be really bad for us. So we need to make sure that you can't be at a disadvantage if you come to the scheme, because obviously we want you to be happy and tell everybody else how great it is. So what's the incentive for coming in now is you apply, we turn around your application normally within two weeks, often much quicker. Once you've accepted it, you can start the next month and you start getting paid just over three months after that. So the sooner you come in, the sooner you can start getting paid. And then when we offer the new options, you'll be able to add those on. So you won't be at any disadvantage. You'll just start earning money earlier in the scheme. So there's no reason not to go straight in now. What's available now in SFI are three standards. If you're on moorland, you can assess the condition of your moorland and you can do that on top of any existing agreement that you've got because it doesn't in any way um, conflict or overlap with any exist with existing agreements. Um, if you're on arable or horticultural soil, then there's a standard there for you to look, take care of your soil, keep your ground covered over winter, add organic matter, um, those sorts of actions. And if you're on grass, improved grassland, same thing, look after your soil, keep, don't leave ground, ground bare over winter. Um, so take a look at what's there now. If you log on, it's very straightforward for you to see which things are, are you eligible for and you can enter into them there. Um, if you're not in countryside stewardship already, or if you are and you want another agreement on the side, that's also just open for applications for higher tier and the window for mid tier will open in March. So it's also worth you taking a look at that, because if you go into countryside stewardship, we will just evolve the scheme with you in it, if you see what I mean. So you should, there's no reason to delay going into that either. And you can have you can have both. You can have SFI and countryside stewardship, as long as we don't pay you for the same thing twice on the same land and as long as they're compatible with each other. So crack on if you want to start getting paid is, is what I would say. OK, so we so we can take that as if I could if I entered SFI now, February the 16th, tomorrow, um, I, I would in the summer, July, May. Summer starts in May, Janet, I think. Yeah, um, don't worry, I'm not doing civil service summer, so I am aware that it's not summer in November. I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if if those options, as in when they become available, in, yeah. I could add those in yeah. on the they become available that so that's yeah, we'll make that's, it possible for you to do that yeah okay well that's really that's that's that is that is definitely good to know and can i just confirm there's quite a lot of questions on on countryside stewardship which i will come back to but just on mm. what you've said about mid-tier becoming available 
Um, are we still looking at a January start date for those? Yes, we are. Yeah, this year we are. But what we want to do for countryside stewardship is have a rolling window. So for SFI, you can apply whenever you want for SFI all year round. Um, we might close it for a brief period between kind of closing down the 22 offer and opening up the 23 one, but it'll only be very brief if we do that. Um, so we do that all year round. We want to do the same thing for countryside stewardship. So what we've done to countryside stewardship this year is improve the application process so that it's more straightforward and a bit more aligned to the SFI experience and to automate more of it so that we don't have to spend months processing all the applications. We can do it a bit quicker. Um, and that is the laying the groundwork for us to be able to then offer a rolling window later. So that we, we want to move to a position where all of the schemes are on a rolling basis and you can come in whenever it makes sense for you because we know that that makes better sense for farmers although some farmers have said to me if you don't have a deadline i'm never going to get around to it um and i <laughs> and i can relate to that uh, but that's on you i'm afraid yeah. <laughs> you get around yeah. to sowing your seeds you can get around to going into a scheme i think we'll much to better to have the flexibility yeah yeah ourselves um okay finally just on the general uh things about options that are available at the moment obviously the management fee was announced in early January. When can we expect to be receiving that? Uh, we had a question in the chat about that. Uh, a very happy SFI yes. um, subscriber, I think, who's received his first money but hasn't Good. received the management fee. Um, so when can we expect that to start coming through? So you are accruing it now if you're in the scheme. We'll pay it later this year. We've got to work out what's the most straightforward way of doing that. And um, you're working that out now. But so you are accruing it. And we obviously want to get it into your payments as soon as we possibly can. It'll be later on this year, sort of around the summertime, I expect, at the same time we open SFI, okay. that sort of timing. OK, so once again, if I if I was to sign up tomorrow, 16th of, of February, I will be eligible for the management fee, yes. but I won't get that in my first quarterly payment. Yeah, you I... won't. Yeah, you won't see it yet in the service and you won't get it in your first payment, but we will, we, you will be accruing it and we will pay it to you as soon as we can. OK, um, so just just moving on a little bit, Janet, we've got a, a question from a member in Northumberland, and I think this maybe reflects uh, quite a bit of what we're hearing from the uplands and grassland in particular uh, and, it, and it says it looks like upland farmers and those farming on common land are going to be the biggest losers in the transition there is little that I can find within what has been announced that will allow me to recover anything remotely close to the BPS payment I will be losing is the government no longer interested in supporting upland farming Lynette maybe you could answer that as well in a minute we'll let Janet um, tell us why that isn't the why the government are still interested, but uh, yeah. it, it's it's a common theme, Janet. I think we are we are finding with with uh, the questions, and we've got a similar theme from a, a member in Devon, which I might just come on to after you've picked this one up. Yeah, so we we, we are certainly interested in the uplands, and the upland upland farmers play a really crucial role, not only in producing the food that you produce but also in your local communities and also looking after that incredible landscape up there in Northumberland and other areas of the uplands so we absolutely are not intent on leaving you behind or commons for that matter and um, commons are eligible to apply for SFI we've made sure that that's possible we've got some work going on with with some commons experts which will broaden out to include more people shortly about how we can make it easier for commons to participate in schemes and how we can reduce the risk of disputes happening within commons when you enter into a scheme by offering useful guidance and um, support so that you can set yourselves up right to start with if you're coming into a scheme for the first time. So commons are eligible and are entering into schemes and already are in HLS often um, and sometimes CS high tier. We are in terms of upland what we're offering for the uplands we have added more options into the uplands um, offer within countryside stewardship in recent years and many of the prices for those have gone up pretty significantly. We've and we've put the beginnings of the moorland standard into SFI that at the moment is focused on assessing the condition of the moorland. But if you have a look at what we published last week, there is a lot more to come on that. So there'll be some more options that will go into SFI, which will be things to do with um, managing rough grazing, managing wet areas, um, managing the overall kind of landscape as part of your farming. And then there'll be additional new options going into, into countryside stewardship as well next year to do with, say, peatland restoration and other sort of more advanced types of options and more specific 
specific to the terrain. But there's already 130, so there's 130 actions that you can do. If you're already in a scheme, which I know many upland farmers are, you can add to that by having another agreement along the side or transferring from HLS into countryside stewardship higher tier. But if you don't want to leave HLS, that's fine. You can extend for five years and have countryside stewardship on the side. So you have got access to all those increased prices and options. Um, and, and farming and protected landscapes, we've just said, will extend for a year and expand um, and that will carry forward everything that's good about that scheme into the future as well. So if you if you are one of those who's in a protected in a protected landscape, like a national park, which I know not everybody is, you've got access to that funding as well. Um, and then there's, there's all the work we've done if you're a tenant farmer in the uplands, which many are, to make sure that the schemes are accessible to tenants as well. So we've done a lot already, but I'm not claiming that it's perfect. I'm certainly not claiming that it's finished. And we're very much open to feedback and suggestions about how we can continue to refine this offer because we really, upland farmers ought to be really well placed to capitalize on, this, on these schemes um, and earn an income from producing public goods alongside food in that setting in a way that helps you to offset the BPS reductions that you're looking at. So we are, we've come, we think we've come a long way. We think we've got a good offer there. We're, we've accelerated some aspects, but we're not, I'm not claiming it's perfect or finished. And I'm, we're very much open to feedback and suggestions about how we can carry on refining that offer. And we very much do want to see you all engaged. I encourage you to look at the detail is all I would say. If you haven't done so already, which you may well have done, I, I really encourage you to have a look at the detail of what we published last week to see how it stacks up for you and what your options might be. All right, thanks, Janet. Lynette, do you, can, you, can you add anything from a sort of tenant perspective and the issues that we are getting raised by members around the uplands and perhaps touch on the grassland issues we're finding as well? Um, yeah, so I think where we're finding issues is the devil is in the detail at the moment um, and that some of the um, standards have certain requirements for example um, soil samples to be taken every hectare well in some upland situations a hectare could um, sorry it needs to be taken every uh, field parcel well in the uplands um, one field parcel um, will only be a small percentage of a hectare, so you might have up to three field parcels per hectare. So that's increasing your cost of testing for soil samples, um, which then means your income is severely diminished. So it's that sort of detail um, that yeah. we're finding is uh, problematic at the moment, and it really needs to be stamped out. Um, so we, we're working really hard um, with Janet and her team, and Helen Radmore, our um, Treasurer, who's an upland farmer in, on Dartmoor, is um, representing the TFA in those discussions. So it's really good to have that practical um, knowledge there. So it, it's it's something where there's there is a problem, um, but we can only work to improve it. And uh, it, yeah. without sounding like a broken record, any concerns any upland farmers or moorland farmers have. Um, or are seeing, please do give me a ring um, in the office so that we can kind of. Um, elevate them to DEFRA. Yeah, and just to show you, that does feed in because that issue you just mentioned about the um, parcels. And so in the soil standards, you're asked to take samples and assess your soil condition in each parcel. But because of that feedback, we changed the rules and said that if you've got multiple parcels, all of the same soil type and management, you can bundle them together and just do it, do it on a kind of on an area that makes sense to you. Um, and that partly that was because I stood on a farm and somebody said to me, you must be joking, I don't have to do it in every single parcel that they're all the same, come off it. Um, but also because of colleagues like Annette bringing those issues to us so that we can make those sorts of tweaks and, and refinements, which is what exactly what we're looking to do to make sure we don't, we absolutely don't want you to be excluded just because of a point of detail like that or, or something that we haven't quite realised the impact until we publish it and then we see the reaction. So we're always open to that sort of feedback. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a really good point as well that the net makes about, and, and maybe we do need to be aware of the, the fact that we are in a very different um, environment than we were when we were talking about BPS or stewardship schemes in the when we were in the EU, because now we do have control over how DEFRA can adapt and change these schemes. So I think we, we do need to get engaged, as Janet suggested, you know, look at the detail if the detail doesn't work, then, you know, flag it up as quickly as you can to us and we will uh, try and feed that back to DEFRA because I think it's really important that we, you know, we can get changes made, whereas perhaps um, in the old world we, co we couldn't. Um, we, we, we'll maybe just go into a, a, just a little bit of detail on, on this one, Janet, as well, because it touches a little bit on 
uh, which I think is quite a sensitive area around things that are open to or perceived to be open to landowners, but perhaps not to tenants and land managers. Um, so it's quite a specific question, but I think it covers a few areas, if, if I could just say. So, so this will remember in Devon, who, again, talking about um, uplands, the, the the options to abandon grass blocks or to complete farms um, in size for £333 a hectare per year from the improved grassland standard or grass arable areas uh, or not and not farm them after the first year places the tenants at a distinct disadvantage because they can't take those options up because they would be in breach of their tenancy agreements. The perception then is obviously that landowners, particularly large conservation charities, are incentivized to take land back in order to claim these higher rates. Um, and therefore, it does put the tenant at a disadvantage. So uh, I wonder, one of the suggestions in the question is that maybe there would, should be a, a restriction on the maximum area for these options and whether DEFRA would consider that. Um, but maybe you could just cover, Janet, how you're addressing that landlord-tenant uh, or, the, or the tenant access to schemes where it would appear that the landlord has a distinct advantage in being able to do that. And it may well be a simple option, if you like, for the landowner to say, I'm better off without a tenant, and then I can get these options going. Uh, and that's, I know that came across in the Rock report, and there's some yeah. stuff in SFI already, which makes it more accessible to tenants, but this yeah. is another step on. So perhaps you could let us know how you're addressing that. Yeah, so there's a few, this is very much a strong theme in the Rock Review. And actually, we had been talking with, with you in Tenant Farmers Association beforehand. And that's how come SFI is as it is with the more flexible terms and conditions because of the issues that we discussed even before the Rock Review. But, but during that, these issues came up. And there's a number of categories of things. The first category of things is things that you ought to be able to do as a tenant within your contract, within your rights, within the course of your farming, without any consent from the landlord or anything else. And for all of the options that are suitable for that, we're putting them on those terms so none of our terms or conditions should in any way get in the way of you doing those actions so cover cropping companion cropping looking after your hedgerows all those sorts of actions ought to be things that you can just get access to and we've made the terms and conditions of the scheme much more flexible to make that possible then there are some actions which are more things which are not obviously within the terms of your tenancy contract or which a landlord might have an interest in and some of those are things that are like that just because we've designed them in not quite the right way and we, we need to keep taking a look at them and saying well hang on are we making this as accessible as possible and some of them are things where the landlord does have a legitimate interest in that particular action because it's longer term it's changing the value of the land it's changing the use of the land um, and for those particular sets of options what we want to do is bring them out as as widespread as possible the highest chance possible of a constructive positive relationship where landlord and tenant can come to some kind of fair agreement about participation in schemes and some of the things in the rock review around that were things like being able to have a joint agreement between a landlord and a tenant where the landlord does is responsible for some aspects and the tenant's responsible for others or being able to pass on a tenancy from one ten, an agreement from one tenant to another really straightforwardly and so there's some aspects of scheme design that we're looking at there to make sure that we can create the conditions for that sort of positive relationship relationship where the particular one about um ground cover i think that's probably i mean george will have expertise on this i think that's a bit of a moot one because I, I think that's a sort of in a sort of gray area where you could I, you might be able to do that in the course of your normal farming but you might it might be seen as something that's taking it out so i'd be i'm keen to hear what if george has got any thoughts on that and I'm, I'm keen to follow up as well if there are any particular issues on that specific type of option where it's something that you might normally do in the course of your farming if you owned the land for a period of time, if you're doing it as a temporary arrangement or even a permanent one, um, but actually it might be outside the terms of your contract. George, have you got any other thoughts other than what I've said on that particular one? Uh, yeah, I think I think there's a particular issue, Janet, around the what what are called the rules of good husbandry and making the most efficient use of your yeah. holding. And uh, as you will be aware, that's something that has been referred to in the Rock Report that we need to look at those rules, which were written, let's face it, in 1947, when the world was a very different place and need yeah. to be revisited in, in the modern context so that it's about uh, the rules of sustainable husbandry or, or yeah. uh, so that you're building in the environmental management. Because what we have seen is that some tenants have been um, impacted by landlords who said, you know, this is not good farming, this is not good husbandry, therefore we're going to serve you with an notice to remedy. And we have been involved in arbitrations where the rules of good husbandry have been used against tenants, both on 
86 Act and, and 95 Act uh, agreements. So I think it is it is a it's one of those areas where we could do without having that leverage being brought to bear on, on individuals and people feeling free to be able to go into these schemes without fear or or, or, or concern that the land was going to come after them for whatever reason. But in addition, um, just on the wider issue about the landlord taking this land back, again, one of the other rock recommendations was that there should be a quarantine period to prevent landlords from accessing scheme money if they've resumed land from a from a tenant former. And obviously, that's another area we're waiting for you to respond to in terms of those recommendations. But uh, th that's a scheme design position where we could say to a landlord, OK, well, we, you, you did have a tenant. You now don't have a tenant. Because you don't have a tenant, you can't have access to the scheme for, let's say, a year because you should have done a joint agreement with your with your tenant. So that, I think there are some very technical legal questions here that do just do need to be cleared up. And, and I don't think that it's, it's not against government policy. It's, it's in line with government policy. Uh, but we just need those rules updating um, as, as soon as we can. Yeah, and we've got we, so we're looking at all of those things, and but what we're trying to do is look at them all in the round because there's various aspects. Of this is kind of how do you treat land for tax purposes? How is it treated for scheme purposes? How does it work in terms of the tenancy agreement and the flexibility around that? And they're all interconnected, aren't they? Which is why the rock review is so helpful because it looks at them all together. Yeah, um, and that's what we've got to do. But the, I think everybody is aligned. I'm sure ministers have said this publicly already that in wanting to create that environment where the positive where it's more likely there'll be a positive relationship and that tenants can, can can take advantage of these schemes in a fair accessible equitable way and we've made some steps towards that i think we would all say and um, but we know we've got more work to do on it so yeah we'll count we'll yeah keep... I, I don't i don't think to sorry mark to, to cut across again but I, I don't i don't think there is there's a there's a sheet of paper you could put between us and you in in saying this is the direction of travel i think the problem is that you you might it might end up in the too difficult box because of the need to change things like tax and regulation mm -hmm. and, and and all of that. But 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 we really can't miss the opportunity that we have at this moment to make the necessary changes that we need to see. Yeah, and we don't we don't have a too difficult draw in our program. That like we're here, we're here to do we're here to do major transformation and make things better. We're not interested in putting things in a difficult draw. So that that definitely won't happen. But it might take longer than ten minutes because it's difficult. Like that does sometimes happen. So um yeah. Watch this space for the rock review response and for us carrying on working on this issue together. Great. Th thanks, George. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I thought it was prescient, Janet, when you were talking about landlords and tenants working together, there was a black cat walking across the back of your screen. So maybe that tells us something about there's some good luck coming along the way that, that will make landlords and tenants work together. I, I mean, I guess on a serious note, I do think that a lot of, uh, a lot of what is coming through through ALMS is a bit of a once of a lifetime opportunity for landlords and tenants to work together. And anything that your schemes do to try and encourage that collaboration should be welcomed. And we as tenants ought to be trying to have those discussions discussions with landlords where, wherever possible. And obviously we're aware of situations where sometimes that isn't, that the relationship isn't as healthy as it should be. Um, I ju just move on a little bit. I'm, I'm really conscious of time, but we are definitely not going to get through all the questions, I for sure. There's a stack of them. Um, but there's a few uh, things around countryside stewardship in particular and countryside stewardship plus. Um, and there's one here which is, covers a few different angles to it, which is from uh, a member, Michael Summers, who says, th thank you for answering various questions regarding uh, countryside stewardship and social media in recent weeks. But there's still uncertainty around cancellation of existing agreements and replacing them with new ones. Can we do this without a break in the scheme? So in other words, not have a year without a claim or whatever. Capital items that have been started, can these be re-entered into a new scheme? And as a sort of follow-on question, will new grants be accessible on a rolling basis and rather than committing to all capital items at the beginning of a scheme, can we kind of add them in as we go? So there's a few different sort of angles there. I wonder if you could pick up on a few of those. Yeah, so this is this is about capital primarily, I think. Yeah. On the kind of rolling basis, so we have changed the rules on capital. So it used to be that you had to do them all in the first two years and then that was you done. We've changed that. So you now have three years to complete your capital works, but also once you're done, you can have another capital agreement if you want. So you can go in with some capital to start with and then do some more later in your agreement if that's what you want to do. So those are, that's new rules for... The, the new rule about having more later on, I think, came in last year. The extension to having three years to get it done came in this year. 
Whether we'll move to a fully rolling basis, I don't know yet. Um, I'd be interested if that's something that lots of people want to do. Certainly, it's the sort of thing we're very open to look at. Um, it can be helpful to think about capital and revenue at the same time when you're designing your agreement overall, if you've got an idea of where you want to start. But we definitely do recognise that you might want to do more later in the agreement. That's why we've got the standalone offer so that you can do that. Um, in terms of the... Um, Having a new scheme agreement, if you want, it's a bit unclear to me from this question. If you want to follow up, by the way, Michael, I'll, I'll pop my email in the chat if I'm misunderstanding your question because I worry that I might be. But in terms of cancelling, I think you're talking about capital agreements. So if you've got a capital agreement that started before the 1st of January this year and you want to get the new capital payment rates, then what you you can do that for anything you haven't started yet. So you can, can you can just not do those things in your existing agreement and have a new capital agreement for the things that you haven't started yet in your old agreement. So I think that's what you're asking me, in which case, yes, you can do that. Um, and if you haven't started, yes, you can put those new, those things into the new scheme. But if I if I have misunderstood you in any way, Michael, then please do drop me a line. I'll put my email address in the chat for you and anybody else who wants to follow up. I always welcome an email from a farmer. They're much more entertaining than some of the internal governance emails I get. So <laughs> please don't ever hesitate to drop me an email. I was, I'm always keen to follow up if I've missed anything. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Janet. I'm sure that will happen. Um, I guess the other thing, which is a more general one, which comes from a member in Lincolnshire, um, saying, although steps are taken to ensure that SFI takes in the consideration of issues for the tenanted sector, particularly, you know, three-year agreements and, 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 and so on, we haven't got the same confirmation of that in Countryside Stewardship Plus, Given that countryside stewardship is also, as it stands at the moment, is, is typically a five-year agreement, how is that like? I mean, that was raised in the Rock Review, obviously. Um, how, how will that be viewed in countryside stewardship plus? And can we be reassured that tenants will have the same kind of access, even though they're longer-term agreements? Or maybe they'll be shorter term there. Yeah, so there's, there's quite a few things which we still offer through countryside stewardship that we think we should offer on SFI terms and agreements because they are so, the sort of things that lend themselves to shorter agreements and don't need landlord consent and should just be able to be done. Then the, the, the other things that are in the countryside stewardship include some things that also shouldn't require landlord consent but might need a longer agreement. And for that, we need to make sure we've got the right rules in place about transferring things from either from, from one tenant to another or between landlord and tenant or whatever, so that if you do... So you can come in for the duration of your tenancy um, and that what some of the rock review recommendations point in that direction and we're looking at those very seriously and then there are some aspects of countryside stewardship which are about more significant land use change where the landlord we think has a legitimate interest and the question there is what we were just discussing earlier about how do we make sure that you're not you're not closed off from those and there's the opportunity to have a productive relationship and we know it can be done because in landscape recovery as i mentioned earlier these are 20 years plus kind of projects and half of the first lot of projects included tenants actively working as part of them so we know it can be done um, and what we've got to do is recreate that magic for everybody as much as possible obviously we can't let we can't kind of cater for a relationship that's just not working and we, like we can't force you to have a positive relationship but we can create the right conditions for that to happen and we think we've managed to do that in the first round of landscape recovery we want to build on that so that people can get involved in those long-term projects and if we can do it there we must be able to do it in countryside stewardship is what we're thinking and it's just about getting the rules right and getting the environment right and getting the incentives right really so we're looking very seriously at the rock recommendations for some of those we'll say okay we recognize the problem we're not quite sure that was the right answer though we've got a different answer what do you think about that and we'll carry on having discussions with the group about that where we think actually we might have a better idea that has solved that problem um or a different way of approaching it um but we're very much we're very very much wanting to achieve exactly what the questioner is getting at so that you can have access to the widest possible range of things to do and you're not excluded from stuff just because we've set the scheme up in a way that means that that's more likely. Okay, thank you and, and and in terms of Countryside Stewardship Plus are we are we also looking at the summer for that becoming available or are we looking at mid-tier being basically what we've got in 2023 and then countryside stewardship plus in 24 where yeah. we're just timing wise is that yeah so this year's offer for countryside stewardship there are some changes but it's more it's more it's another evolution there's a new um higher tier capital offer we've refined some of the options and um, we've changed the rules on capitals etc and we changed the prices for this year that's it for the cs offer 
what we're then working on is adding in the extra options next year and adding in this CS plus element where you get paid extra for joining up across your local area and some of these other elements where you get paid for doing things at the right level of ambition or in the right places to get really good results. So that's those those aspects. The thing about those aspects is that on the face of it, they all seem like very straightforward, great ideas. But in our tests and trials, we discovered that it's a bit more complicated than that. So if you're being paid to join up across a local area, what happens if one person doesn't do what they said they were going to do? Does that mean everybody doesn't get paid or what? And we've got to get the rules right in the detail to make sure that we can do this in a way that is fair and actually going to work for people. So that's why we're taking a bit more time to test those aspects of the scheme um, over the course of this year so that we can introduce them again later. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got we've got a couple of questions. I think there was one was sent in and Charles Skelton has always also asked this. Perhaps you could just reassure the question is with an existing CSS contract stewardship mid-tier, I'm currently unable to access SFI. When might this be possible? Yeah, I can give you a good answer on that, I hope. Because so, so in the pilot, in the SFI pilot, we couldn't allow any land that was in CS into the pilot because at that stage, the only way we could do that was to do manual checking, and that's extremely labour intensive. We've now built the system that means that if you're in countryside stewardship, you can go into SFI as long as we're not paying you for the same things twice or for incompatible actions. So it might be that if you're in CS on every single parcel and it's all covered in things which are covered in the soil standards, you've not got a lot of options there now, but still you should be able to do some of the things that we're going to offer in the summer, in, even in that case, because the next iteration is that we allow you to stack more than one option on the same parcel as long as they're compatible with each other. So you can do that now. If you've got, for example, a countryside stewardship margin around the end, edge of a parcel, you can have your SFI soil standards on the rest of the parcel. Um, but we, we need to be a bit more sophisticated about this in the 2023 offer so that you can do more stacking and it's more flexible in that way. So I don't know when you last looked at it, but if you looked at it a long time ago, you wouldn't have been able to get in at all. If you look at it now, you should be able to do some soil standard, I would have thought, on some of your land. It's unlikely you'd have the whole thing in CS in a way that we excluded you out of thought. Um, but even if it does, then have a, have a look at what's coming on this in the summer and you'll be able to see there, hopefully, some options that will work for you. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right, Janet. I think certainly having gone through it myself, I think if, you, if you've if you not got an option, if you like, in the middle of the field, in the cropping area of the field, you can certainly put SFI yeah. in there and usefully it calculates what that area is for you. So that's yes. quite handy. So it's quite a good application process. Um, just, I'm really conscious of time. We've overrun, but I would just like to finish off with a quick question or a couple of questions around the animal health and welfare pathway. Yeah. Uh, I'll just lump two together, actually. What One is from a member in Gloucestershire saying that he's been attempting to access the scheme. I think I've heard this from others mm -hmm. and received a message that it cannot get in at the current time because only a certain number have been invited. Uh, when is it intended that that will be opened up more widely? And perhaps yeah. a, a sort of a supplementary to that, um, Nick Bullen asks that a vet option is only available for sheep or cattle. Uh would it not be sensible to be able to, to to have that for sheep and cattle, if you like? Yes. So, so for two farm visits, um, and, and is that likely to be possible? So kind yes. of lump two things together there. Yeah, so we're doing a kind of incremental rollout of this because this is another area where we've built some new technology. So it's a very straightforward application process, but we've got to just make sure it's working for everybody and iron out any um, bits that don't quite work as expected as it, as it goes into reality. So currently, if you want to get a vet visit, you can join the wait list with the RPA and they'll let you know when we're ready to let you in. So you should be able to, I'll, I'll post on, if, I'll post a link to our blog or Julia can, uh, if you wouldn't mind Julia in the chat, um, where you can find details of this and you can find details of how to register your interest if you want to get involved. And you might remember last time we did this with SFI, we said to begin with, if you want to get involved, contact the RPA and we'll let you in a few at a time. And then as we get more confident in it, we make it available for everybody to just access. And we'll get to that point as soon as we possibly can. Um, but we don't, we don't like to run and fall over. We like to make sure that we're making sure everything works. And it's only when you actually have people in the service that you really find out, oh, this bit didn't quite work as expected. So that's what we're doing. It's working great for everybody. We're getting really good feedback. So we're hoping we can roll it out quickly. If you want to join in, join, contact RPA and join the queue. Um, you'll, you might get a message that just says you might have to wait for a bit. That might be the message that you've had, but that doesn't mean you're not in the queue. So don't worry about it if that's happened. Um, on the sheep or cattle, we're currently offering it for, you've got to choose what species you want it for, but we will get to offering it for multiple species. So at the moment it's one visit per farm because we're um, 
incrementally building the service and adding in more functionality as we go but we will offer both in time so you could get you could get involved now for one of your species and then do the other one later or you could do a visit for both of them together at some point later on if that's what you'd like to do um i would encourage you to have a go now because you might you know why not get the benefit now it's free and the, so that might have useful things for you to do for the one species that you've chosen and it might make sense for one rather than another at a particular time anyway um, but yeah you're right it would be much better if you could do all these species and that's where we're headed okay thank you um okay that's that that's brilliant Jana. Uh, as i say I'm, I'm sort of conscious of time and and the uh time span of concentrating on zoom calls um, as well uh, i'm really conscious that we've we've pro we've really we've more than scratched the surface with obviously what's going on but we've uh, barely covered a lot of the questions so uh, i'm really really grateful janet that you'll be able to pick pick these up and yeah happy and to you was kind of collating them um we have i've noticed a couple of questions from uh one in particular oliver white and another one from claire uh Hathen white asking about essentially where do you start there's too many there's too many schemes where do you start you know how 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 can i get advice which doesn't involve an agent so i can kind of make my own decision so i'm gonna i'm yeah. gonna plug uh the tfa offer here to try and answer those questions and uh on the 15th of march we've got a uh another webinar uh so a month today which environmental scheme is right for your farm so uh we've got sandy capilla from the rpa uh, and David Meredith, who's a rural business consultant for DJM Consulting. Um, so I'm sure that won't answer Oliver and Claire's questions completely, but they might give a steer to people um, as to wh where we should be looking. And, and I guess one of the one of the things that we do all have to get our head around with with Elms and the new schemes is that. I guess we've got very used to in the past having what effectively with BPS was a very simple scheme. Um, we may we may not have thought so at the time, but uh, essentially, if I had a hectare of land, uh, I would get paid a, a sum of money uh, if I filled the form incorrectly. We are in a very different environment, and I think we are ourselves, the government, DEFRA, we're all trying to achieve a very wide range of of, of outcomes. So. Uh, whether we like it or not, it is going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, but I, I think it, it, we do have to get involved a bit ourselves, read some of the detail. There is a lot more detail out there than there was um, towards the end of last year, so that's to be welcomed. So uh, I think we, yeah, we have to we, we have to kind of uh, get involved, I guess, and 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 see where the detail is. It's not going to be straightforward. Uh, it's not it's not like filling your form in on the fifteenth of May. I'm sure some people filled it in before the 15th of May, but um, normally it was the 15th of May when it was filled in and I was hopefully going to get my money in December. It's a little bit more complicated, uh, but hopefully we're achieving more by doing it. So we have got that uh, webinar on the 15th of March, so four weeks today. So please don't forget that. Uh, a big thank you to both of our speakers tonight for, uh, for joining us and, and helping out. Thanks very much to Lynette and to Lynette for all the work you do on behalf of the TFA it really is sometimes I know it can be a bit thankless but it's much appreciated by by all of us um, thank you very much Janet as well to uh, for coming once again to speak to us and no doubt we'll be asking you back to uh, come at some point in the future to tell us more as things develop always happy um, to do that and thank you very much for having me no problem thank thanks Janet um as as I said at the start, um, this has been sponsored by Oxbury Bank. So a big thank you to them uh, for sponsoring this event. And please take a look at, at what their offer is. Uh, it's, as I say, it's a little bit different maybe from what we've been used to in the banking sector. So that's wor worth a look. And thank you to all of those, all of you that have attended. Uh, apologies for running over time. Uh, and uh, we, if you want to look at any of these questions again, or look at look at it back, it's on the website, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, please encourage any other uh, tenants that uh, you you might know to go and have a look, and more importantly, to join the association and get the benefit of everything that we do. So, thank you to Janet, thank you to La to, to Lynette, thanks to Oxbury, and hopefully we'll see you again next month, fifteenth of March. Uh, which environmental scheme is right for your farm. Thank you.